Today I'm going to tell you the story of a drive that I used to take twice a week there and back again, all the way across northern Indiana, not quite from one state border to the other, but you know, fairly close. That would take me two hours each way. And it was from Rose Lawn, Indiana, where my family lives and where I'd, I'd bought a house with my inheritance and plunked my, my family down on family land all the way over to North Manchester, where there's a little, what we call a small liberal arts college, a slack called Manchester College, which for all I know, maybe Manchester University at this point in time, because they added a, a master's program and this or that, right? It's a kind of a common dodge that's done by small colleges to try to uh, raise their status. Now, there's a whole story about how I wound up teaching there and what that was like, and I'll tell you a little bit about that, but I'll mention that this drive that I was doing in my um, 2000 uh, something Ford Taurus wagon, you know, driving across the countryside, listening to the radio or CDs that I burned of, you know, metal music or to uh, books on CD. I was doing this every Tuesday and Thursday for an entire semester. And so, you know, it was through familiar territory and the changing of the seasons was something quite remarkable. It led to a lot of moments of beauty that I, I would like to share with you. And I'll tell you about the itinerary. But first, let's talk about how I wound up teaching there and what it was like. So when I graduated from Southern Illinois University, when I finished my dissertation, I made a very different choice than most of my academic um, peers, colleagues, which is that you go wherever the jobs are. You take your family and you uproot them. And if it's only for a year or two years because it's a, what we call a postdoctoral thing or a temporary teaching assignment, well, that sucks for you, but you know, you'll just have to do that. And I've had colleagues who've moved, you know, almost every single year. And I was, you know, uh, I was going on 32 and I was uh, married, already had a, a child and, uh, you know, my family, the Lemrees family uh, of my mother's side was, was very important for me to be involved with. You know, I would see them fairly occasionally when I was living down in Carbondale, Illinois, and I'd been on my family land since I was a kid when they purchased it in the 1970s. And I spent, you know, many of my summers there in these houses. So I, I thought, well, you know, my mother had died. I had a small inheritance. Why not use that and purchase one of the family houses that was, was going to be vacant? Um, because, you know, Uncle Hubert had died years before Aunt Tunney or Aunt Therese was suffering from Alzheimer's and living with my Aunt Bibian. These were my grandparents' uh, uh, generation. So I should say great aunt and great uncle. And, um, you know, there was, there was land that came with it and a lot of uh, cool stuff to do in the yard. I've talked about that in other videos. So that was what we did. Instead of just going wherever the jobs were, we plunked ourselves down and I began looking for work. And so I sent out letters, cover letters with my CV to pretty much everything within what I thought to be a two hour radius. As a matter of fact, one of the places that I in fact got hired at and worked for for six years, uh, Ball State University, was a little bit further than that, about two and a half hours, but I miscalculated. It's a good thing that I, I did because that wound up being my full-time job. So um, fairly quickly, I got hired by Purdue uh, or by Indiana University Northwest uh, to teach um, at one of their extension places to teach a professional ethics class. I had a you know, great background in ethics. And Manchester College, the chair, got in touch with me and he was like, would you like to teach two ethics classes? Uh, the pay isn't very good. As a matter of fact, it was the worst pay that I ever received as an adjunct. 
I think it was uh, $1,800 per class, which is just peanuts, right? Uh, but, you know, it was the opportunity to sort of keep my, my foot in the game and uh, have, a, you know, some more teaching experience. And so I said, sure. And then, so I already had, you know, three classes lined up, one that was only about a half an hour drive to the north, and then one that was going to be a two-hour drive there and two-hour drive back. Um, and then Ball State University, you know, fairly close to the end of the summer, got in contact with me and said, listen, we need somebody to work full time up in Indiana State Prison teaching philosophy and religious studies. Can you take over these these classes on uh, Mondays and Fridays? And I was like, yeah, I, I can do that, right? So I was teaching eight classes that semester, which is a very heavy load. Four classes uh, per semester at a teaching college is considered a full time. So I was basically doing... Uh, twice what uh, most of my, my colleagues were, were doing. And that's if they're teaching four. Some of them only teach two per semester. So, you know, I go through all the, the hoops of getting hired by um, Manchester College and went to the new faculty orientation and all of that. So I'd made the drive already and I was like, oh, this is going to be kind of, kind of long. But fortunately, it's state highways most of the way. So you can make some pretty decent progress. Now, before I tell you about the, the drive, I'll tell you a little bit about teaching there. So it was, you know, a pretty campus, as these things often are, these small liberal arts colleges. But like many, it had been dropping its standards from year to year to year because in order to, to stay afloat, they have to take in more and more marginal students. The better students will go to better places. And so the students there were nice except the manipulative ones, um, but they were not well prepared academically and they were not used to doing real work, you know. And Southern Illinois University, not really, when it comes to the undergrads, not a great school, right? It's got a reputation as a party school. The kids who are living in the Chicagoland area and can't get into the better state schools go down to Southern, right? So I was used to dealing with students who are underprepared. Within a week and a half, of my teaching and grading assignments from my ethics class, the students were complaining to the chair who basically told me that I needed to dumb down the class without using those words. And when pressed on it, would say, no, 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 I'm not going to tell you how to teach the class. I just, you know, you have to deal with this and this and this and this, which led to me, you know, relaxing standards quite a bit. Um, and I was, you know, pretty unhappy with that. I also didn't find that that chair to be a very good guy in general. Um, he was kind of snide. Uh, you know, he made sure to tell me, nobody's going to hire you, you know, to teach Maurice Blondell, so I don't know why you wrote your dissertation on him. Just kind of jerky stuff. So, you know, it's a good thing I didn't stay there. But he'd been there for years and years and years. And, and you can tell this, when somebody has gone to a great school and they wind up at some rinky-dink college, probably something's gone wrong in their career and they're kind of bitter about it. So anyway, that was that. Was that. I, I will say this, they had uh, um, a great cafeteria. You know, I enjoyed eating my meals there and I'd sometimes chat with the students and stuff like that. And, you know, it was fun to teach the ethics classes. I, I do really enjoy that. So enough about the college itself. So I would get up in the morning and I would get on the road and drive all the way across the state to get there, park on campus, teach my classes, hold my office hours, have lunch. And then it was time in the afternoon to drive home. And the only bad thing about the drive, other than, you know, it's sometimes tediousness, was the fact that I was driving into the sun in the morning and driving um, into the sun coming back because I was going east in the morning and, and west in the afternoon. But the drives were quite enjoyable. So that part of Indiana where Manchester College is, is kind of rolling hills. Uh, it's not as flat as the um, originally marsh area the, uh, of Indiana where uh, I was living. Uh, that entire area is reclaimed marshland, by the way. There's a whole story to be told about that. So I would get on the road uh, in North Manchester and take Highway 114 
east and you know i'd be going through these these forested hills and every once in a while you go through a little village and you pass a stand of something um, all sorts of interesting county roads that you could turn off on if you wanted and so i would go through a couple little burbs like like akron and then you know one of the landmarks for me was this town called rochester and there i would have to make a, a little bit of a detour because Rochester is, is a lake town. It's, it's uh, situated around uh, Lake Manitou. And, you know, I, the, the road would actually go by the lake. And it kind of reminded me of, you know, where I grew up uh, here in southeastern Wisconsin. I, I grew up, I'm here in Milwaukee right now, but I grew up out uh, on the border of Delafield and Wales. And, you know, not far from us is Lake Nagawicka, and then there's Pewaukee Lake, and, you know, all, all the, you know, the, the upper and lower Nabobin, where you're actually on the highway driving in between these two lakes. So I was quite used to that sort of thing. And it, it reminded me of a home that I hadn't lived in for over a decade at that point, more, a decade and a half, really, because we moved when I was uh, 17. Uh, to Waukesha. And so, you know, sometimes I would stop there and get out and walk around a little bit. And sometimes I would just drive on through. And then I would take Main Street South to hit Highway 14, right? So I go from 114 to 14. And 14 is a, is a state highway that goes, you know, east, west, a long ways across, you know, north central Indiana. And so I would, I'd be taking that and making good progress. And um, then eventually I would um, uh, get to Winnemac, which is another small city. And Winnemac is, is kind of cool because it's situated on the Tippecanoe River, which is flowing around in there. So you'd cross the, the river and, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of fun to look down at the, the banks and see how high the river is and stuff like that. And then I would end up uh, hitting a, another main state highway, 421, which goes north. Because taking 14 and 114, I was a bit south of where I needed to be. It was just a straight path, right? So by this time, we're getting to a more flat uh, environment. And so I would take 421 North through Madaryville all the way to uh, 143 East. And then I would take that through a, what would you call it? I mean, it's a nature uh, reserve, not a preserve, but it's called the Jasper Pulaski. And it's called that because Jasper County is, is on one side and Pulaski County is on the other. And it was the Jasper Pulaski Nature Center. And, and I took my kids there an awful lot. We would go, you know, hike around and explore things. And there was a beautiful observation place where you could climb up and you could observe the deer or at certain times of the year, the sandhill cranes would nest there by the tens of thousands. You could hear their sounds and see them. It was so cool to do that. And so I would drive through the Jasper Pulaski. There's huge trees there. It's, it's quite beautiful. As a matter of fact, just a little bit of trivia, one of my cousins ended up being the uh, game warden for that many, many years later. He went to Purdue and uh, got his degree, I think, in forestry or forest management or something like that. And so he was in charge of that state property. So I'd get through the Jasper Pulaski, and now I'm in Jasper County. Now I'm only one county over from where I actually need to be, my destination, home, Chez Lemries, our compound that my family you know, lived in and on with uh, acres and acres of land and fields and trails and three houses that were built there by my grandparents and uh, aunt, great aunts and uncles. So then I would continue uh, there and then I would begin taking county roads. And I don't remember the exact numbers or anything. And I, I would switch it up sometimes. So I'd take county roads north so I could intersect Highway 10 south of DeMott, which is in Jasper County. DeMott's another little town, you know, uh, not a hell of a lot going on there. But anyway, I'd hit Highway 10 and now I was on the road that would take me almost 
all the way home. And so, you know, it'd be getting close, you know, at that, that time uh, as the season went on and we went through fall and went into winter. By now, it's actually getting close to dusk. In fact, uh, at the very end of the semester, I'd be driving home the last little bit in the dark after daylight savings time changed. Um, and so, you know, I could, I could uh, take that or I could take 231 up to 110 and take uh, 110 across south of DeMott to Rose Lawn on 10 where they, they coincided. And then I, I hit County Line Road drove north a little bit, turned into our driveway, and then the drive was over. And, you know, part of what I remember about that drive, <clears throat> besides exploring occasionally, I would, you know, I had a map. This is back before cell phones had maps on them. And I would get out the map, which was quite detailed, and I would think, where could I actually explore a bit? Or where could I take a route that will get me to the same ultimate place, but show me something new and different. And sometimes I would take things that weren't even on the map. I would be like, well, let's see where that road goes. And why would I do that? Because I'd put in a full day of work and I was now driving home and taking five extra minutes wasn't going to make that big of a difference when it was a two hour drive, right? And so I got to see a lot of really cool things when you get off onto the smaller roads, at least in the Midwest, I'm sure it's this way in other places as well, you drive past people's houses and yards and you see water towers and old train tracks and buildings that have been abandoned and fallen in. Some of them are barns, some of them are garages. And you know, you would just kind of let your eyes linger over everything. And the other really, really cool aspect about this was that I was making this trek over an entire semester. So a semester begins in late August or early September, depending on where you're teaching, and it runs all the way into December. So you're finishing up the summer, right? Everything is green, or if it's if you've had a drought, it's brown, right? But it's hot and you can hear cicadas. You can have the windows open while you're driving down the road and you can, you can smell the different uh, things in the air, driving past uh, mint fields in some places, lots of places where there's cows and manure, or horses, and you know, there's other things in the air sometimes as well, campfires, um, burns that people are doing, other, other, uh, things like that. And then the smell, of course, of grass, especially if they've been mowing uh, alfalfa for, for hay. So there's all of that going on. And occasionally you go past a restaurant too and you'd be like, hmm, that smells pretty good. Sometimes you even stop and get, get like a hot dog or something along those lines. So, you know, you drive and then as the seasons went on, as we got into September and towards the end of September and into October and all the way into early November, well, that's when the trees change colors. And so you've got brilliant reds of, you know, maples and sassafras and uh, the sumacs and things like that that are growing. And you've got yellows, some of which are almost brown, some of which are bright gold. And uh, then you've got, you know, oranges and browns and some things stay green because there's plenty of pines and spruce and things, uh, trees like that, that you might drive through. And some, some turn later. And, you know, that part of Indiana, there's a lot of oak as well. And so every time that you're driving through, not just because the light would change or it might be cloudy or, or sunny, but because you'd been there two days ago or five days ago, and now because of the progress of the seasons, the treescape, let's call it, the bushscape, the leafscape, has not changed in every single way, but has changed in some ways that because you're familiar with these places, you can tell the difference. And I really enjoyed that. I really liked driving through the countryside, 
you know, and we'd be in some fields and then you could see trees off in the distance and then you approach them and now you're in this just medley of color all around you and then you're out of it and then you go through a, you know, an evergreen grove. Uh, everything is kind of dark and quiet, right? And, and that's the way this drive was until the leaves began falling. And then it becomes the gray time, right? Everything becomes gray and tan and brown and the light is starting to get, you know, failing. The sun is further to the south, so it's no longer in your eyes, at least as you're driving, but it's, it's weak. It's not casting as much light. There, there are longer shadows in the countryside. And then it snows and everything changes, once it snows, driving through a country landscape like that. Not a city where everything turns to slush, right? Or it's so warm that the snow melts away. When you're, when you're driving through the countryside and, it, and it's snowing, that snow will generally stick and it covers the fields. It changes the topography that you're driving through. Of course, you have to deal with ice and, you know, uh, conditions and sometimes the plows haven't been through. So there's snow on the road. You got to take it a little bit slower. But, you know, if you grew up in Wisconsin, that's really not that big of a hardship in a, a state that's further south like Indiana. And so you get to see the trees themselves being covered with ice turning into jewels or heavy laden with snow. Um, you know, they change their very shape. Uh, there's a skeleton of the branches, limbs, trunks, but then there's all this other stuff on it. And so I would drive, you know, and, and I didn't look at everything, obviously, and I wasn't just like looking around like this. I was actually watching the road and thinking about what I'd talked about in class or what was coming up or what's, what's going to be for dinner or, you know, who I'm going to talk to or things like, like that. Um, but I would get plenty of time to look around and just appreciate the beauties of the landscape. So I thought that might be kind of cool to share with you this itinerary that I would take and some of the experiences that I would have and some of the feelings that it would evoke in me working this crappy adjunct job at a little rinky-dink college that, you know, may very well end up closing up in, in coming years if they, if they don't... Uh, uh, many liberal arts colleges are, are having a, a difficult time competing. Um, but it was, you know, this is one of the perks of doing that, um, getting to spend some time by myself on the road, enjoying the nature that these roads had been cut across, but which was always encroaching upon these paths that we human beings have developed. And I thought I would share that memory with you.